thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. From websites and online stores, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence. Hello friends, I hope that you've been well. In today's video, I am going to be taking you through a acrylic gouache illustration and I'm going to be sharing some tips and advice on the process as well as talking about this new favorite paint palette of mine. So here are the colors that I pulled out for the illustration. I end up pulling out more as I go along, but this is what I kind of predicted I would need. These are the brushes that I pulled out that I think I would need for the illustration. Again, as always, all of the items I use is going to be listed in the description with links for all of the supplies. But the main event of this illustration is the palette. So this is by Wet Grass. They sent it to me a while ago. They're not paying me, it's not sponsored, but I am obsessed with this palette. So basically it comes in a case. It gives you a little sponge that you completely soak and wet. And then they give you palette paper that you use on top to actually use your paints on. And I have been using this for months now and I am so impressed with how long the paint stay wet for. If you're familiar with using acrylic gouache, you'll know that they dry very quickly. So here I've done the illustration or at least the sketch with my iPad digitally and then I printed them out, transferred them onto watercolor paper here with my Polychromos Faber-Castell pencils and taped it down to a masonite board and we're ready to paint. So as you can see, a lot of paints have already been laid down on this palette just from previous illustrations. And I love that I can just continue to reuse these paints over and over because when it comes to acrylic wash in a regular palette, whether it be plastic or ceramic, it will dry out very quickly and you can't use the paints again. Whereas when you use regular gouache or watercolors, you can continue to re-wet the dried up paints over and over, which is a huge benefit to using water soluble mediums. But over the past little while, I've realized that I do think that I actually prefer acrylic gouache over regular gouache at the moment. I'm a Libra, so I'm constantly changing my mind about those things, but as it stands right now, I do prefer using acrylic gouache. So being able to use the paints for a much longer duration of time without them drying out is such an amazing discovery, I suppose. Here you can see I'm actually using a palette knife to mix the paints. This is something I definitely recommend. I don't always do it. I honestly am guilty of using my paintbrush to mix my paints for the most part, but I find that using a palette knife, you get a more consistent and even mixing, and you also don't end up having your paintbrush overloaded or ruining the brush because sometimes when you really dig into mixing paints with your paintbrush, the paint really gets like clogged and stuck in the kind of root. And that I find it's harder to clean and just ruins your brushes sooner, if that makes sense. And I'm not the best at cleaning my paintbrushes and acrylic wash, it being a permanent drying medium, it can be, it can definitely take a toll on your paintbrushes, whereas watercolors or regular gouache are a little bit less harsh on your paintbrushes. As for what we're actually watching me work on here, so this is a devil, little, little devil illustration portrait, and this is going to be the Patreon print reward for this month. And as you can see, I first go in with really flat washes to begin with. I do mix it with a fair amount of water just so that it's not super thick. So that's why it's a little bit patchy. And then after the first layer is down, I really roughly map in another layer of paint to create some shading to add a new value. And I'm not really worried about blending or anything like that or creating gradients. This is, I'm saying I approach it kind of in a cell shading manner where it's very graphic and just blocked in, very um, focused in on just large shapes. And the reason for that is I find that it's easier for me to go in really rough and quote unquote messy and then just like slowly refine it over time because this stage we're just trying to cover the 
white of the watercolor paper with some color and also get figure out the actual hues and saturations of the actual colors and not really worry about the blending just yet. When it comes to this illustration and her skin tone, you might be thinking that it looks very, very warm and that is on purpose. I didn't want it to be a natural skin tone. I wanted it to lean on the red peachy side, but I didn't want it to be like a solid red in the way that you might see typical devil illustrations because I wanted there to be some kind of differentiation with the skin tone and the red of her outfit. But before we continue, I'd like to thank Squarespace, the sponsor of today's video. A new feature that I recently figured out is that if you host an online shop on your Squarespace website and you connect your Square Reader, you can actually keep track of your inventory. So for those of you who don't know, if you do in-person conventions and artist alleys, a Square Reader allows you to accept card payments, which is such a game changer these days since people often don't have as much cash on them. But the annoying thing about selling merch online and in person is keeping track of the inventory in two different places. So if you connect your Square account with Squarespace, it will actually keep track of the inventory when someone purchases something online and then it'll adjust for you on the website. So streamlined makes your life so much easier. So if you're interested in launching your own website, head over to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash I'm a wonder for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Since there is so much red in hue and tones in this portrait, I thought that to help break it up and create more interest, I would have a little bit of a blue kind of ring light or lighting coming from the opposite side. The, as you can see, I've sort of established that most of the light source is coming from the right side. And then there's a softer kind of blue light coming from the left. And this is something that I've been experimenting with a lot lately. I just think it creates yeah, a lot of interest and I'm such a fan of adding lots of color into my illustrations. So yeah, I think that the blue just helps break up all of the large amounts of red and pinks and corals. And then of course her hair as well. I didn't want it to be just a solid black. I wanted it to feel dark, but I think that adding in like a dark purple as opposed to a black, again, just gives the illustration a lot more color and vibrancy. And yeah, again, similar to the skin tone, I'm just very kind of messily blocking in the different tones here. I think I mixed, I think two or three different tones of purple to initially map out the hair. And again, mixed with a fair amount of water, which is why it's so patchy. Cause with acrylic gouache, if you wanted to have a really smooth application, you wanna have work, you wanna work in layers and you wanna work in thin layers so that you're not getting a lot of texture. This is just a personal preference, some people really like having the texture of like the brush strokes and the, the paint, but for me, I like to have it really smooth and flat. So pretty much I almost always mix my paints with a little bit of water and I use less and less water as I kind of make my way through the kind of final stages of the illustration so that the paints are more thick. So now we're getting into me actually doing gradients. So you can see I put down some paint and then I used a clean wet brush to buff out the edges so that it will blend in with the layer underneath. And this is pretty much the main tactic of how I approach shading or blending or gradients, I should say. I did have a lot of trouble trying to figure out exactly the color I wanted for the skin tone. So you can see me really trying to mix various different tones and shades. And it um, was initially coming off really, really dull, which is not what I wanted. I wanted it to be very vibrant. And the thing is with the way that I work, I do a digital version first. And so I'm trying to match the color to what I did digitally. 
And I think at this point, I finally managed to get closer to the color I wanted. And you can see I am doing more shading and more detail work with the face. Or maybe not details, but we're getting into actually rendering the face. And we're getting lots more coverage and we're seeing less and less of the actual paper. Which I find that with gouache, it's like it's so much smoother of an application when there's paint underneath as opposed to working on just the paper. And so you can see again the blending technique where I'm putting down a layer of paint and then using a clean wet brush to buff out the edges. And another thing to keep in mind is if you have, you know, pre-mixed colors two or three different colors on your palette ready to go, then you can lay them down next to each other and then use the brush to blend them together and make a more seamless transition. And this is a huge benefit uh, of having the wet palette is that you can mix lots and lots of paints without worrying, it, uh, worrying about it drying out. Cause that was something that I always struggled with when I was using ceramic palettes is that I wouldn't want to mix too much paint because I was worried about not having enough time to use up the paints in like a certain amount of time. And so with this palette, even though I spent several days working on this illustration, I didn't have to remix the paints that I already had laid down just because they had they they stayed wet the entire time. Here I am now going in with some of the darker shading elements and for this I'm using a lot more magenta and as we move or move kind of throughout the process, I introduced some like kind of purpley mahogany type tones in the shadows as well. You'll see that I work in very small increments of value, which can be frustrating to watch, I'm sure, because it seems like it's so tedious, but this is just the way that I like to work and how I get it to be fairly blended. But yeah, this is the footage that you're seeing. It's sped up. 150% or like 1.5 times the speed. Uh, here you can see I actually, I end up using kind of the masking tape or the side of the paper, uh, the side of the illustration here to put down some paint. Cause what I was finding was because I've been reusing this paint palette so many times for several different illustrations, I'm continuing to run out of space. And I find that with the amount of paint that I was putting on the palette, it was getting really crowded. And so I was using the masking tape there to kind of take off some of the paint because it was like overly loaded. Does that make sense? Like I, I wanted less paint to be on my paintbrush. Um, so I was like dabbing it onto the masking tape because yeah, the amount of paint on the paintbrush is kind of, you know, I didn't want to have too much. And again, it's all about creating that really, really smooth application. Here you can see I'm finally getting into a more contrasted tone and it's basically like a really, really light pink. And yeah, again, the same blending motion of slapping some paint down using uh, a a new or cleaned off damp paintbrush to smooth things out. My preferred paintbrush sizes, or not sizes, paintbrush shapes for acrylic wash is rounds and filberts. The filberts are like rounded on the ends, but they are flat in the shape. Does that make sense? I find that they're really handy for, again, getting that flat, smooth application that I prefer with my acrylic wash illustrations. And obviously the rounds are really great for detail work and getting into smaller nooks and crannies. And as for the type of brush, I prefer a synthetic paintbrush that is kind of right in, right in between of being flexible and stiff. I, you don't want it to be too soft because it can't hold the paint as well because it's a, a lot 
uh, heavier than like a watercolor but you don't want it to be too stiff because then the I find like if the brushes are too rough you can see all of the kind of like bristle marks and again it, it really does depend on the type of painting you want to do but again I I don't want to have a lot of visible bristle marks or brush brush strokes And yeah, I'm sure that many of you are thinking that this illustration feels marginally familiar. And yes, it's it did kind of make me think about the scene in Jennifer's body with Megan Fox. I've actually never seen that movie, but obviously the scene or the, the screenshot of her with the lighter and she's like sticking her tongue out. It's like pretty iconic. So that definitely was something that I kind of realized as I was drawing it. I was like, oh yeah, this is, you know, this is basically very similar to that scene. And yeah, it wasn't meant to be like a home, like an homage to that scene what at all, but it is a motif that I recognize as very, very similar. And yeah, now we are moving into the shading of the red items or like her clothes, um, if we want to call it clothes. Uh, yeah, I wanted to emulate the shading of the skin, but make it a little bit different so that they don't feel too similar. So I basically, yeah, made the shading of the red items a little bit more purple in the approach, I did make the mistake, not mistake, but I continue to use fluorescent paints, which reads, it's hard to read on camera. So the, the shading, the nuances of the shading is harder to see on camera um, than it is in person. But anyways, yeah, you can see again the blending technique of going back and forth between multiple different shades of paints and using a new brush to kind of blend them together. And going back to the paint palette, so this type of paint palette is something that I've been aware of for a very, very long time. And I resisted getting it for a really long time because I had always assumed that it was going to be an expensive item to have. I assumed that I would constantly need to repurchase and reuse the sponge and the palette paper. I thought it was something that would just get, yeah, expensive having to replace those over and over. But I have to say that this particular one, this is the only uh, brand that I'm familiar with in terms of me using. I've never used other brands before, but I started using this in January, which is crazy because we are now in June. And I've, I've obviously added more paints and new paints onto it over and over and over, but I've never had to replace the palette paper and I've never actually had it to like remove the sponge and re-wet it. It definitely has shrunk a little bit like the sponge because it doesn't have as much water as it um, on it as it did initially. But what I actually do is using that like bottle of water that you've seen me use um, that's just filled with tap water. I actually just pour water around the edges of the sponge to continue to keep it moist. And that has worked. It has maintained this moist palette for many many months and when if you're familiar with working with acrylic wash on a ceramic or plastic palette you'll know that it when it dries it creates like this like plasticky you know material essentially and if you try to use paints on top of it and when you're adding water with it the the plastic dried up paints will like break up and then like go into your new paints and it creates just like an awful mixture. And so I'm, I always would have to completely clean the ceramic palette and then start anew. But with this wet palette, even if the paints have dried up a little bit, they they're still like moist enough that if I add more water, they're just they just reactivate 
similar to a regular gouache wood in normal circumstances. And so I've been able to just, yeah, like reuse areas, even if it had a little bit of paint left over on it. It's seriously amazing. I highly, highly recommend getting a palette like this if you use acrylic wash or even a regular acrylics if you want to keep your paints wet longer. And yeah, I'm a very distracted person. And so it's amazing to be able to just start working on this for, you know, maybe half an hour and then you know, I can close the lid on it, go eat lunch and come back and the paints are still wet and they're protected from dust or debris because they have a lid on it. And then, you know, I can use the paints again for the next illustration. And yeah, like I said, I worked on this illustration over several days. There was actually over five hours of footage that I've edited down and yeah, I feel like this is a total game changer, probably a, a, an addition to why acrylic wash is now my favorite medium at the moment is being able to have so much flexibility with this paint palette. And yeah, not only do I love not having to remix colors to match what was already going on on the illustration, I'm also saving so much paint because I don't have to worry about any of it drying out before I get to use it. So now we're kind of getting into the last leg of this illustration. As you can see, I was doing a lot of pushing and pulling of values. I really had so much fun on the hair. I've talked about this before, but I find that I still struggle with how I want to render hair, but I feel like I'm coming to a place that is really working for me, at least with the this illustration. I really like how it turned out. Here you can see I'm actually holding my digital sketch um, close to the painting because I'm trying to emulate what had been done in the sketch and do the line art, especially in the eyes here, because as you can see, a lot of the sketch is completely gone from all of the layers of opaque paint. Here I'm adding in the blue. I actually realized that my paint water was like too dirty. So as you saw, I was actually able to use just like a wet paintbrush to erase the paint while it was still wet. And the only reason I'm able to do that is because the acrylic wash layers underneath are totally dry. And again, just love that type of technique that I can do with acrylic wash that I definitely can't do with watercolors or gouache is these like really watery glazing effects because with watercolors and regular gouache, the paints underneath will be disturbed much easier when you're scrubbing and doing really watery layers like that. So something that I really, really love about using acrylic gouache. And yeah, I added in more blue for the blue kind of ring lighting there. I'm working on all of the little shading and highlights of the hardware. And I have not painted a portrait this large in quite a while. I say large, it's not that large. It's letter size, basically uh, eight and a half by 11 inches, but it's large for me because I don't typically paint portraits this large in general. I've been kind of forcing myself to work smaller with the assumption that working smaller means it will be, um, it'll be faster to work on. This did take me quite a while to work on, but I think I was just really getting nitty gritty about the shading and the blending and all the details and stuff. This definitely took longer than some of my previous illustrations have in the past little while, but I'm, Glad that I took my time with it because, I don't know, it's it's nice to actually try and complete something to your best ability as opposed to rushing it. And so I'm glad that I'm getting to a place of trying to spend more time on things as opposed to feeling like I need to rush. Although I definitely need to just better 
time manage myself so that um, these Patreon rewards get done sooner. Anyway, the benefit of working on a portrait this big is being able to do more details and eyes are definitely one of my favorite parts of a portrait. So I really enjoyed being able to put more details in her eyes. Eyes are actually something that I'm also figuring out how I want to approach. I'm, I feel like I'm kind of switching up the style of how I illustrate eyes pretty often, but I'm, I'm definitely someone who is a believer of not having to force yourself into a quote unquote consistent art style. So I, yeah, I've been very much inspired by like retro manga and retro anime, like that shoujo style eye where it's just like big and dramatic and the lash lines are just like so exaggerated. So I had a real, a lot of fun just like playing with that. And yeah, here I'm working on just deepening some of the shading and smoothing out some of the gradients. I'm really trying to push the values so that certain elements stand out more. So like, for example, the shadow shape underneath her jawline, I'm really, really pleased with how that turned out because I feel like it makes her face really stand out a lot more. And I think that, yeah, the benefit of using acrylic wash is that you can go exaggerated, but you can always revert back, essentially. You can fix something, you can push and pull the lights and darks much easier because the paint is opaque. Whereas with watercolors, you have to be a lot more precious about how much, um, how dark you go because you can't really lighten watercolors very easily once you've gone too dark. That being said, I do end up using watercolors for the background of this piece and it did kind of make me miss using watercolors. It's been a little while since I've used watercolors and there is something really magical about watching the paints move across like a wet surface, which you'll see in a moment here. I'm working on the little details of her mouth and I love putting in the highlights. For her skin here, for the highlights, I actually did like a speckling motion. You can see I'm doing like a dabbing motion. And the reason for that is not only to kind of mimic like the texture of skin, like pores, but it also makes me think of glitter as well when you put on makeup, when you use like a, glitter, a glittery highlight. So as I said, for the background, I decided to use some watercolors and the background, I just wanted it to be a sort of gradient of various kind of dark purpley tones. So here I busted out a few of my Daniel Smith paints here on a ceramic palette, just kind of squeezed out the paints there, added some water, and I'm putting a layer of just clean wet, a uh, clean, <laughs> clean water across the background because I want to use a wet on wet technique. So going in with this really dark indigo first and like I mentioned, there is something so magical watching watercolors bloom and move across the surface and creating those gradients with all the different colors. And this is why I wet the paper first so that we get a much more seamless kind of blend between all of the different colors as I'm working on it. And there's just something, yeah, really magical about the way that they kind of interact with each other. And I did purposely pick a few watercolors that are granulating. So what that means is they have like kind of multi tones within them. And so when it dries, it has like variations in tone. After it, that first layer had dried, I go in with a second pass. This time I decided not to wet the entire paper, but just sort of move in a rotation basically. So what you have to do is make sure that you work quick enough so that the edges of the paint that you've put down stay moist or stay wet. And that's how you're able to avoid any obvious brush strokes and keep the kind of gradients melding within each other. It's not perfect, but I didn't want to 
oversaturate the paper. So yeah, that's the way that I did it. And also I think that the paint is much more concentrated and more like the value is a lot deeper doing it this way as well. I think I did a third round uh, on the background that I didn't show just cause it was the same process. And then yeah, here I'm cleaning up the edges and just adding more highlights and little details. I realized I should give her little fangs because of course, and I'm glad that I thought of that before the illustration was done. Then using my favorite white Posca paint marker to add in those really bright white touches of highlights on her skin and the hardware on her outfit as well. I decided to use a watercolor pencil to map out the where the flame was going to be and then I also realized that I almost forgot about her earrings and they were obviously completely covered up so I had to redo them and the mindset with using a watercolor pencil as opposed to a regular color pencil colored pencil is that I figured after I did the painting and everything had dried I would be able to use just like a clean wet paintbrush to basically like buff away the watercolor pencil since it's water soluble. It worked to a degree. It definitely wasn't perfect, but it did work enough. So I was happy about that. And then, yeah, I finally remember to sign to actually put a signature on my illustration here. And yeah, just adding in those final touches. These were all of the paints that was left on my desk. I didn't use all of them, I don't think, and this is this is definitely excessive, but it's just funny to see how many tubes I ended up pulling out. And so if you're interested in receiving a print of this really fun devil illustration, I'll have the link to my Patreon page down below. You have until June, 30th to sign up to receive her and if you also want this is going to be the sticker reward for this month I think she turned out really really cute and yeah that is the conclusion of today's video thanks so much for watching like subscribe comment you know all that YouTube stuff it really helps out the channel and yeah I hope you have an amazing day or evening wherever you're at and I hope to see you in the next one bye